Welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. And now, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Genesis. Tonight is study number 20 of Genesis chapter 8. And we're going to begin reading in verse 12. And he stayed yet other seven days and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seven and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. I'll stop reading there. Now, um, in our last study, we were looking at verse 12 again, where Noah had stayed, and we saw that's the word hoped, for seven days, another seven-day period, and he sent forth the dove, and that's the fifth time the word for dove is used in this chapter, pointing to the atonement. He sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And from the first time, we, we understood that the dove was looking for a place to rest the sole of her feet and found none. And we saw that that language, the sole of the feet or sole of the foot, relates to stepping upon, treading upon the promised land. And the promised land points to the new heaven and new earth. And that is what God also is looking towards where he will have the eternal dwelling place with his people, and that is where he will rest the sole of his feet. And, of course, the dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit, who is eternal God, looking for that eternal habitation, the dwelling place with his people. Well, now that Noah has sent forth the dove this third time, and that would point to the purpose of God, in the previous two times, the dove returned to the ark. But this time she returned not again unto him any more. No longer would the dove come back to the ark. And we wonder about that. What is the spiritual significance of that? Historically, it's understandable. The dove found dry land and, and uh, established a new life for itself in the world that, that had taken shape after the flood. That, that's no problem. Spiritually, again, the dove not returning is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And it must be that the Holy Spirit, or typified by this dove, the dove finding a place to rest the sole of her foot, is a picture of God, the Holy Spirit, or God himself, finding that promised land, finding the, the place where he will remain forever and ever with his people. We saw that with the language of Ezekiel 43.7 compared to Revelation 22, that God will dwell with his people. And so the Holy Spirit goes forth first to uh, pave the way and, and, and to guide the people of God into the new heaven and new earth. Well, then it says in verse 13, And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year in the first month, the first day of the month. This is the year, the, the biblical calendar of history, we were following along when we... Um, uh, came to the point of the flood, and we know the biblical calendar locked that in at 4990 B.C. That was Noah's 600th year. This is the next year. And in the Old Testament, um, 
method of of counting because our, our calendar is geared to the supposed birth of Christ. Uh, we we count down on the Old Testament side, and, and so forty nine ninety minus one year would be forty nine eighty nine. It's a countdown to the year zero, and so this is the year forty nine eighty nine, and it's also now one hundred and twenty one years from the point that God had said man's days would be 120 years and and that timeline went until the flood and now it's the 121st year i'm only mentioning that because of how 121 breaks down 121 breaks down to 11 times 11 and 11 is the number that identifies with the coming of Christ um, to give evidence or to demonstrate his atonement. And therefore, it's a number that relates to the atonement. And this is 11 times 11, a strong emphasis upon Christ's atoning work. And it's not surprising because at this point, Christ's atoning work is being fulfilled in all that he has saved. All that have had their sins atoned for by him and all who have likewise were in him at the foundation of the world to experience that atonement and who in the day of judgment have gone through a demonstration of atonement because all judgment, all wrath of God the punishment for sin is the law demanding payment for sin and that sums up the atonement so the atonement of judgment day the entire period can be viewed as a, a day of atonement in that sense the atonement period of judgment day is completing and and so in the 121st year we see 11 times 11 comes into view. Well, God also tells us the date once again. It is the 601st year in the first month, the first day of the month. And just continuing on with an understanding that uh, the months in view in the flood account were 30-day months. Okay, it goes on to say in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And the waters were the waters that brought the wrath of God. They typify the furious anger of God upon um, the rebels of mankind that have transgressed his law. And now it says they've dried up. Now here, this word dried is 2717 in Strong's Hebrew Concordance. And also in the last part of verse 13, where it says, Behold, the face of the ground was dry. That's also 2717. But in verse 14, where it says, And in the second month, on the 7th and 20th day of the month, was the earth dried. That's a different Hebrew word. That's 3001. But they're both being used in a similar way. Although I think the Strong's Concordance number 3001 in verse 14 is, is probably indicating just uh, the ultimate in dryness. Yet we also are getting that idea from this word because this word is found in Psalm 106 verse 9 where it says he rebuked the red sea also and it was dried up so he led them through the depths as through the wilderness it's used of the crossing of the red sea the lord parted the waters and the israelites were told went over or through the sea as on 
dry ground. Now, the word dry ground used in Exodus is a word that's uh, yet again another Hebrew word, 3004, that's related to 3001. And so here in Psalm 106 verse 9, the Lord is using the same word. So we would have to understand, I guess, maybe the other word doesn't mean even drier, but certainly this word is being used in a similar way. This is the same word also as found in Isaiah 51 verse 10. Art thou not it which hath dried the sea, the waters of the great deep, that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over? That's another allusion to the crossing of the Red Sea. When the Israelites went through the water as on dry ground. Now, um, what this would mean spiritually go to a couple of verses for 3001 since we're discussing it. If we go to Joshua, Joshua chapter 2, it says in verse 10, For we have heard how Jehovah dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites, and so forth. That word dried is the 3001 word. And again, in reference to the Red Sea, in Joshua 4, verse 23, For Jehovah your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until you were passed over as Jehovah your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. And the crossing of Jordan, likewise, was on dry ground as the waters stood up and the Israelites went over, and it's a a very similar picture of entering into the kingdom of God, the promised land, or the new earth. Just one more in Revelation. This is a Greek word, but uh, it's important because it shows us at the time of the end how God is using those historical occurrences of crossing the Red Sea on dry ground, crossing over Jordan, likewise on dry ground, and relating it to a spiritual picture at the end of time where we are at, where we're presently living. It says in Revelation 16, in a chapter dealing with the outpouring of the seven last plagues in the day of judgment, In verse 12 of Revelation 16, it says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. Now that is very much related to Isaiah 51 that we read, that spoke of the depths of the sea being dried as a way for the ransom to pass over. The kings of the east and the ransomed are spiritually one and the same, God's elect people. Or it's a similar picture as found in Isaiah 11, verse 12 tells us, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel. That's again like the kings of the east or the ransom, God's elect, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Then we read in verse 15 and 16, And Jehovah shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river, and shall smite it in the seven streams, and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be a highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that he came up out of the land of Egypt. And this remnant of the people are God's elect. We're a remnant out of the whole, many called, few chosen. And 
again and again, the picture that the Bible draws is crossing over a sea on dry ground. Because water, the water of the flood, the water of the Red Sea, the water of Jordan, the Egyptian Sea, the water of, of Babylon, the, the Euphrates relates in some way, but, but the water primarily has to do with the wrath of God. And when the wrath of God is completed, that is, when all the water dissipates, it, it all goes away, then there is a path that God's people trod in order to cross over from this world to the next, from the cursed creation to the blessed creation, from temporal life to eternal life, from the body seeing corruption to an incorruptible. This is the way that God has outlined for his people in order for them to gain entry into this eternal new heaven and new earth. And, and so it has to do with the judgment drying up or the judgment being completed. But also when we read of the water of Babylon, that fits in with the idea of the gospel, the aspect of the gospel concerning evangelization, uh, wherein the gospel goes forth into the world to save sinners, that water has dried up. And that also is part of this pathway that God has prepared for the kings of the east, for his people. And, and so as we're uh, currently making our way through this prolonged period of judgment, we're going day by day. It's as though we're taking a step every day. We're, we're stepping on dry ground concerning the gospel that is dried up, yet it's not completed concerning the judgment. And so there is a need to wait and to hope for this dryness to occur for the Lord's judgment program to complete, to finish, and, and then we will be brought all the way through. All right, let's go back here to verse 13 of Genesis 8. And it says, The waters were dried up from off the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. So at this point, the first day, first month, 601st year. And again, it, it ties in with um, 11 times 11, 12 times 12, and so forth. At this point, Noah removes the covering of the ark. And the word remove means took aside. And, and up until now, we weren't even aware that the ark had a covering. That is, when God was giving the dimensions, when, when he was speaking or laying out the blueprint for building it, the Lord mentioned building an ark and rooms um, you'll make and pitch it within and without. And he, he spoke of the length of the ark, the breadth of the ark, the height of the ark. He, he told us about the window and the door and the number of stories, first, second, third stories. But there was no mention of a covering. This is the first time that I'm aware of that we read of a covering that was a part of the ark. And so we wonder, why is God telling us that Noah removed the covering? And what does that mean, in other words? We, we can understand that there must have been some type of covering, and, and this covering was, was very needful because it was going to rain a, a torrential downpour and probably like nothing we've ever seen. If you've ever uh, been out and caught in the rain one day where it, it was just like a cloudburst 
and just great amounts of water drop down from the sky all at once. Well, that might give you a starting point to understand how much rain was falling continuously for 40 days and 40 nights. And so if there was no covering on the ark, the, the ship would have taken on a lot of water and would not have been able to make it through the 40 days and 40 night period. So the covering protected it from the rain. It, it, it was necessary that the ark be covered and the covering stayed on for 294 days until this point. And now it's coming off. Now we can uh, get some idea what the covering was made of, even though we're not told in, in this verse. But this word, the Hebrew word that the Lord is using here in verse 13 is 4372 in Strong's Concordance. And it's a word that is found, I, I believe, 14 times in the Old Testament, once here, and 13 other times in association with the tabernacle that was in the wilderness. The, the tabernacle that the Lord commissioned Moses to build. For instance, we read of that tabernacle in the book of Exodus... There, there are several verses that I think we'll have to pick it up next time, but we can look at a verse or two now. I'll just go to Exodus 26 and verse 13. And a cubit on the one side and a cubit on the other side of that, which remaineth in the length of the curtains of the tent. It shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and on that side to cover it. And thou shalt make a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red, and a covering above of badger skins. The covering for the tent, the tabernacle, was the skins of animals. In Exodus 36, 19, And he made a covering for the tent of ram skins dyed red, and a covering of badger skins above that. So it's it's the only material I could find that, that the covering is described with. Animal skins, just like when we looked at um, the pitch and we saw that the word pitch was atonement. And we realized spiritually, of course, all within the ark, the people and the animals represented God's elect except for the not clean animals that typified the creation looking for deliverance and becoming a new creation. And so the protection for all within was the pitch. It waterproofed the ark. The atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ provides spiritual protection against the wrath of God that comes in the form of the word of God or the water. And this kept them safe. Well, now we see there's an additional picture where there's a covering over the ark. And considering that, again, when you look up this word covering and its use in regards to the tabernacle, it's animal skins. And we expect that that's also what Noah would have used. He would have stretched a great many animal skins um, together, sewn them together, and stretched it out over the uh, huge vessel that was the ark, and it would have protected, again, all the occupants from the downpour, from the flood, from the rain falling from heaven. And, of course, the animal skins uh, could only be obtained after killing or slaying the animals. And that points to the Lord Jesus Christ, just as the clothing that Adam and Eve were equipped with, that God clothed them with, the Lord covered them with animal skins, pointing to the covering of sin. And so the 
the covering of the ark would have been a similar picture. Thank you for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. For more studies and information, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.org. Until our next Bible study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.